Herodotus, the Pyramids. Hello, this is Bertie. In this series, I'm taking you on a tour of the histories of Herodotus, the ancient Greek who loved to travel and to explore the world and different cultures. He wrote around the year 450 BC. His second book is all about the fabulous, weird and wonderful land of Egypt, ancient Egypt as we would call it now. And of course, one of the things that everybody knows about the ancient Egyptians is that they built the pyramids. The pyramids are some of the most impressive structures built at any time in history. For example, the Great Pyramid of Giza stands 138 metres tall. It held the record for being the tallest building in the world for three and a half thousand years, until the Eiffel Tower was erected in Paris as the entrance to the World Fair in 1889. Its engineer, Gustav Eiffel, compared his tall, pointy creation to the grandeur of the pyramids. And the Egyptian pyramids were a true marvel of ancient engineering. Each side of the Great Pyramid of Giza rises at an angle of 51.3 degrees and is aligned almost exactly with true north, south, east and west. The Great Pyramid was just as famous in ancient times as it is now, and is the only wonder of the seven wonders of the ancient world to survive to the present day. All the others, including the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Temple of the Goddess Artemis at Ephesus, and the Lighthouse of Alexandria, are now turned to dust. The word pyramid actually comes from the Greek word pyramis, which means a wheat cake. The pyramids reminded the Greeks of their own pointy-topped wheat cakes, which they loved to eat. Herodotus writes about the pyramids in a way that assumes his audience already knew what they were. But of course, few Greeks had actually seen them with their own eyes, as he had done. Any visitor who gazes upon the pyramids must wonder how they could possibly have been made by a civilization without hydraulic cranes, bulldozers and steel girders, and all the rest of technology that goes into erecting, say, skyscrapers. In fact, quite a few people have concluded they must have been made by aliens or gods or superheroes. But Herodotus tells us they were built by human effort and suffering. What he does not say is that they were built by slaves, as shown in the epic biblical movies complete with blood and sandals. And most modern historians agree that the pyramids were built by free Egyptian workers, perhaps farmers in the part of the year when their fields were flooded by the Nile and they had little to do. Herodotus says that originally the people of Egypt lived happy lives under their rulers, the pharaohs, but when a pharaoh called Cheops came to the throne, he brought misery to the land. Now Cheops is the Greek name for Khufu in Egyptian, and he was the pharaoh who ordered the Great Pyramid of Giza to be built. He was on the throne around 2600 BC and reigned, says Herodotus, for 50 years. But he was far from a popular ruler. Herodotus claims he closed all the temples and forced the Egyptians to work for him. Some had to cut stones in the quarries for his vast building projects. Some had to bring the stones in boats along the River Nile. And others had to build, build, build in the burning sun. And the fashion for pyramid building was not buried with Cheops's mummy. Herodotus reports that for a hundred and six years Egypt was a sad place, while the pyramids were built and the temples were not open. The Egyptians he met hated the memory of those kings who built the pyramids so much that they would not utter their names, and called the pyramids after the shepherd Philetus, who previously pastured his flocks of sheep where they now stood. The first great project of King Cheops, or Khufu, which took ten years to complete, wasn't in fact a pyramid. It was to lay a broad road from the River Nile to the site where he planned his pyramid. 
Herodotus says the royal road was paved with polished stones and that statues stood along its sides all the way. Just building the road was a huge accomplishment. In addition to the road, a canal brought water from the river Nile so that the pyramid could be protected by a moat. The pyramid itself took 20 years to build. It was made in steps and its sides are like stairs. Herodotus says that wooden machines lifted up great stones one step at a time. The description makes sense at least, and so it is kind of odd when he then states that they made the pyramids from the top down. It's rather fun to imagine the highest point of the pyramid floating in the air and the other stones being placed beneath it. But what he must have meant was that when the structure had been built, the final outer layer of polished stone was added from the top down. An inscription on the pyramid told visitors how much money had been spent on the food for the builders. Apparently they lived on a diet of radishes, onions and garlic, and the cost of feeding them over 20 years was 1,600 talents of silver. By my calculation that makes 450 tons of silver in modern money, which would buy an awful lot of radishes even today. The pyramids were built as tombs for the mummified pharaohs, along with many beautiful and precious possessions that were placed inside. Later pharaohs were buried in underground tombs, presumably to hide them from grave robbers, or maybe because building the pyramids involved too much cost and misery. The most famed collection of elaborate royal tombs, the Valley of the Kings, lies further south along the Nile, near the site now called Luxor or ancient Thebes. But Herodotus says that the pyramids were far from the only wonders in northern Egypt near the city of Memphis. There were wonders in his day even more wonderful than the wonders of the pyramids. He visited a vast maze or labyrinth near the city of the crocodiles, and if he had not had a guide he might never have found his way out. He tells us that the maze was intricate and windy and full of carvings and statues. It was made of twelve roofed courts with doors facing each other, and there were three thousand rooms, fifteen hundred above the ground and the same number under the ground. He visited the above ground maze, but his guide refused to show him, but his guide refused to show him the labyrinth in the basement, because kings and sacred crocodiles were buried down there. The labyrinth was described by Roman writers later on, but does not exist to this day. One Roman writer, Pliny the Elder, a famous geographer, described the labyrinth as a bewildering maze of paths, adding that anyone who entered the temple had to find their way through a confusing array of ramps, porticos, rooms and stairs, and was confronted by a fearful noise, and had to pass through chambers and darkness. And if the labyrinth was not amazing enough, Herodotus also describes a vast artificial lake. In the middle stood two pyramids rising out of the water, and on top of each was a colossal stone figure seated on a throne. The lake was filled with water for six months of the year via a canal from the Nile, and for the other six months the water flowed back into the Nile. And those are just some of the amazing buildings of ancient Egypt. Herodotus tells us that they were far more wonderful than anything the Greeks built, even the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus on the mainland of what is now Turkey, or the Temple of Hera on the Greek island of Samos. As ever, Herodotus is gently reminding his readers that the land of Egypt is more ancient, vast and wonderful than their own Greek civilization of which they are so proud. It is humbling to travel and to learn about faraway places and peoples and puts everything in your own life into perspective. And we too today can wonder at the massive achievements of the ancient Egyptians. And I thought you might like to know that I'm writing a book set in ancient Egypt about a favourite story nori character, Lapis the Cat. I hope to finish writing it in a few months, but it seems that books take about a year to be published. In the meantime, please don't forget that you can buy my book now called Undercover Robot, 
about a lovable android called Dotty. I wrote it with David Edmonds, a philosopher, and it has lots of clever stuff going on under the light and fluffy surface. For now, from me, Bertie, at StoryNori.com, goodbye. <laughs>